so far of the Custom Arch installers, we've looked at Arch Linux GUI and also the Anarchy installer. And both of these have one thing in common, that being they use a custom ISO. Today is different though. Today we're looking at ArchFi and its literal first step is downloading the install script. So right now I'm running the official Arch ISO and we're gonna go and run curl-lo and we can download this from one of two places. I'll leave both these links in the description down below. So archfi.sf.net slash archfi. This is downloading it from the SourceForge, or we can download it from the GitHub, that being from mattmol.github.io slash archfi. Either link will work, but the SourceForge is recommended. Now the FI in ArchFi stands for fast install, and in some ways it takes this quite literally. It lets you just jump directly to what configuration options you want to modify, and then leave the rest without going through every single prompt. In other ways though, it's quite slow, and you're going to see why this is my least favorite install script. So if we want to run this, all we need to do is run sh archfi, because we don't actually have it chmodded, and there we go. Now it's launched. So it uses an end cursor interface like we saw with Anarchy. The first thing you're probably going to want to do is set your editor, because by default it is set to nano, and I don't know how to use nano, so we're going to set it to vim instead, so I can actually retain my sanity. Now, one thing to keep in mind is it does not do dry runs. Dry runs do not exist. Every single option you set is going to be run when you set it. This can lead to you breaking the installer, for example, changing your keyboard layout to something that isn't supported by your keyboard. So just keep in mind that it's basically as dangerous as using the regular manual installation. But at least it does tell you every single command that is run as it's actually run. So the next thing you probably want to do is set up your petitions. Now, it does have the option to do manual petitioning with CF disk and CG disk. No F disk or the other one that people use, G disk, that one. Uh, but it does have an auto petition for GPT and for DOS. Now, I'm running this on a DOS system, so let's go and choose that one. Let's choose the one drive I have. Yes, all the data will be erased. Cool. Uh, sorry, yes, you want to type? And now it's going to go and do stuff automatically for us, going through, what is this, F-Disk? Yeah, F-Disk. And there we go, now it's done. Now, unlike most installers, it doesn't actually take you to the next step. Instead, it throws you back at the window you were just at. So if we pressed Enter again, it would actually jump us directly back into that window. So make sure you go and navigate over to the back button instead, and then move back to the main screen. So from here, let's go and select petitions and install. Here's the first problem. So did you pay attention to that petition table? Because if you didn't, well, go back and rerun the auto petitioning, because it's not actually going to tell you what any of those petitions you just made actually are. Even just telling you the size of the petition would be enough to know what each petition actually was. Now, I know that because it is following the Arch install guide, SDA1 is going to be the boot, we don't have a swap, the root is going to be on SDA2, and then we don't have a home. So this is fine, and that's going to work. But if you don't know that, it's not going to stop you doing something like, say, putting the boot on SDA2, putting the swap on SDA1, putting the root also on SDA2, and then, let's say, the home on SDA. That, even though it literally doesn't make any sense as a petition table, it's going to be fine with. So, because it doesn't make any sense, let's go and format the drives and see what actually happens. So, our boot is going to be XT4. Yes, that's fine. It's going to do that. Our swap is going to be a swap. Cool. Okay. Now, SDA2 is also going to be the root. And then home is going to be on SDA. Now, this is a problem because we've set it to the, uh, the, the master block, not an actual petition. So if we try to continue from this point... Because there's no actual error detection, it's not going to mount stuff properly because we've just eliminated our entire file system again. 
but the best part of that is it lets us keep going with the installer. So let's go into configure Arch Linux and then modify the host name. Now we don't have any of the petitions mounted, we don't even have a working file system at this point, so obviously that's not going to work. But even though there's clearly an error message here, we can just keep modifying things. It doesn't actually care. We can just modify as much as we want, and it's never going to stop us, even though none of this can actually be set. This right here is without a doubt the biggest problem that ArchFi has. It doesn't retain any memory of the user's actions. So it's just an installer interface that lets you automatically run commands that you'd be running manually anyway. It doesn't actually pay any attention to what the result of those commands actually are. So you can easily get yourself into a situation where the installer is still running perfectly fine, but nothing in the installer actually works. This is why a dry run and error detection is so incredibly important for an installer. Without that, it's basically just running the manual installation without looking at what commands are actually being run. Oh, also, because we haven't actually mounted any of the petitions, if we go back to unmount them, it's going to throw another error message as well. I've now rebooted the VM and we are back to a clean slate. This is the nice thing about doing everything with a completely blank system. If you are running ArchFi with a system that already has data on it that you do not want to lose, I would highly, highly suggest getting that data backed up or putting it on a separate drive and unplugging the drive. Don't let ArchFi anywhere near your important data. Now, there are some other weird things about the select petition screen as well. One thing is that it refers to the petitions as a device rather than a petition. I actually don't know what situation you'd ever actually want to select dev slash SDA. I'm sure there's something, but I've never needed to do that. The other fun thing is we can just put everything on the same petition and it doesn't care. It's perfectly fine with that. Even though it can literally see a list right here, it can say, no, stop doing that. That's really dumb. It doesn't care. It just lets you do it. <laughs> like we can just go through this, assign file systems to all of these and overwrite the file system every single time. And it literally doesn't care. It's perfectly fine with it. I honestly thought we were done with this after I looked at the official Arch installer. I thought we were done with these installer scripts that didn't do any user protection, didn't have any error detection, and just let the user do what they want. That's not what an installer should be doing. An installer should be protecting the user from their own stupidity while making the installation process considerably easier. This only does half of that problem. Moving on from that rant into another rant, you probably want to go and modify your mirror list before you go and download anything, so you're downloading from the closest and fastest mirrors, so you don't have to waste a bunch of extra time doing your downloads. Now, you probably never want to go and manually modify your mirror list, because that's stupid. Because computers are much better at checking if a server is alive, if it's fast, and all of that fun stuff that makes your mirror list actually work. This, though, it makes you do it manually. Not to say that there shouldn't be a manual modification option. There are some weird edge cases where you may want to do that. Let's say you run your own mirror and you want to make sure that's in the list. Things like that but it shouldn't be the default, and it definitely should not be the only option. I can't be bothered modifying the list manually, so it's going to stay as it currently is. Moving on from that, let's go and actually install Arch Linux. So from here, we can go and select the kernel we want to use. It's gonna have the four main kernels for Arch, nothing really to say here. Then we can go and install Linux firmware. It doesn't say what Linux firmware actually is. It does say it's optional, but there's another problem here. If you want to go and cancel out of this menu, um, you can't. <laughs> From this point, you're stuck. You can only go forward. I don't know why. Any of these menus that have all of the options highlighted in blue, you cannot go backwards. I'm guessing it's some weird quirk with end cursors, but we're stuck here. So let's go to the next step then. From here, we also can't go backwards, so we can't go and select OK or Cancel. Um doesn't tell us what any of these tools actually are, so I'm going to assume we don't need them. It says file systems, but it doesn't say why we might care about them. So let's go enter again, 
and then it's going to actually install stuff for us. This right here is exactly why mirror sorting is incredibly important. My connection is much faster than 500 kilobytes a second, but because the mirror we're connecting to is, I don't know, somewhere in the world that's really slow, this is happening, and this is going to take quite a while to finish. So 10 hours later, once you've downloaded 500 megabytes, everything is going to be done. From here, do not go and reboot, because if you do that, your install is not actually going to work. Uh, first problem you have is you don't have a root password. So make sure you go into Config Arch Linux, go to Set Root Password, and then set it to whatever password you want. So the problem with Arch Linux is when you don't have a root password, it doesn't actually have passwordless login actually enabled. So it's going to prompt you for a password, but there won't actually be one. And then nothing works. <laughs> Second problem is you won't actually get that far because it hasn't generated an FS tab file. So <laughs> make sure you go and do that <laughs> so you can actually find your drives. Also, make sure you go and install a bootloader because when you ran that PAX wrap, it did install a bootloader. Now, if you're running a EFI system, it is going to have refined and also system deboot in here as well. In my case, though, I'm just going to select Grub, go install Grub. That will take, hopefully, not as long as the previous stuff did. I'll cut back to when it's done. If you want to go and modify your Grub config, you can do that, but that is entirely optional. Grub worked perfectly fine out of the box. Then go install Grub, install it to this drive. This is going to do the thing where it finds the drive, setting up Grub on that, all that fun stuff. And now we are good. Now, if we want to do a reboot, we can. Also, make sure you don't click OK again, otherwise it's going to try to install Grub again. We can reboot now if we want to. But here's my question. Why? Why is this an option? Why don't you just do this automatically? Why don't you prompt me for a root password? Why don't you prompt me for a bootloader? Why do I need to go and manually select those options? Sure, there is a reason why you might not want a bootloader. Let's say you're doing this as a dual boot and you've got a bootloader installed for Ubuntu or whatever you're using. But this one... This one you need. This one you need because it also doesn't prompt you to make a user account. You might notice that there is absolutely no option in Archify to actually make a user account. So I believe that might be in the follow-up script, that being ArchDie, which is Arch Desktop Install. I'll be covering that in a later video though, so if that is there, I will give it credit. But if it's not there, well, that's a problem. But as for the rest of the options in here, they're nothing really that impressive. We have a computer name, we have a keyboard layout, we have the font for our TTY, our locale, time. Uh, we can modify the FS tab manually if we want to. I see we have generate and modify for the FS tab, but not for the mirror list. Anyway, we can modify the crypt tab, we can modify MK init CPIO, which I don't think I've ever actually touched, and there's also another option to manually modify the mirror list. Now, as for this extras option, it's a really weird option to include. So, there's just a bunch of random applications in here. No real rhyme or reason why these are here. Um, but yeah, you can, you can install these. Also, uh, you can't quit out of this menu. So the only way to quit out of this menu without installing anything is to deselect all of these and then press enter. Otherwise, it's going to try to install something. It still tries to reinstall base, but you already have base installed, so not really a big deal. And that is the end of the Archfy installer. It doesn't tell you it's the end. It doesn't give you anything saying, oh, it's okay to reboot now. It just assumes that, yeah, you know that you need to reboot, so uh, go and do that, or run ArchDie, and then continue with the desktop installation. In my case, I'm just going to go and do a reboot, so if we go back, we go unmount, and then going to go and unmount the drive, go back again, then we can go to reboot, and then hopefully, if everything worked, we should be good to go. Doing a reboot of my system, as we can see, Grub was successfully installed, so hopefully our Arch Linux system starts successfully as well. Give it just a moment, and if we go login as root, give it my super secure password, 
And uh, yeah, it worked. So if your goal is installing Arch Linux, Arch Fi can do the job. It successfully installs Arch. But here's the problem. There are so many ways that you can break this install script that even though it works fine, I don't think you should use it. If you want to use an install script, use Anarchy. If you want to have a GUI installation, use the Arch Linux GUI or go and install Endeavor. I don't think the ArchFi is worth the hassle going through. Maybe, maybe ArchDie is a better experience. Maybe the desktop installation actually has something going for it. But I really don't understand why so many people kept recommending ArchFi to me. I've had comments about ArchFi probably for at least a year now, and every single person mentioning it says ArchFi is great. You're going to love ArchFi. It's such a great install script. And I don't understand why after looking at it i thought this was going to be a well-made script that i couldn't easily break by just going through the regular motions but that's what it is so it's cool if you guys like archfy that's perfectly fine but i cannot in good faith recommend that anyone actually uses this I'm currently going through this saga of trying out various Arch install scripts to see which ones are actually worth mentioning. And if you have one that you think I should try out, let me know in the comment section down below and I'll be happy to give it a shot. And if you like Arch Fire and you think I'm completely wrong about it, let me know what I'm doing wrong and why I'm approaching this in the complete wrong way. I just think I'm approaching this like a regular user would and... I didn't even have to go out of my way to break anything. It just broke by itself. So if you like this video and you want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, Scrubstone, and Bearer Pay linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast and a gaming channel linked down there as well. And that's going to be it for me. 